I am about to share a few articles with you which has to do with another apostasy within uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But before I share these articles with you, especially the one related to this apostasy, I want to make this statement very plain and very clear. Those of us who think that leaving the regular line of Seventh-day Adventists or not supporting the Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is a sin, you are going to receive the mark of the beast if you do not do something about it quickly. Why? What I said is not something that comes from me. It's something that came from Ezekiel 9. I counsel thee to look and to read Ezekiel chapter 9 and also what Sister White had to say about Ezekiel chapter 9. And as we read before in Ezekiel chapter 9, we are told that those who had received the mark of the beast or who suffered the destruction there or who did not receive the seal of God were slain. And uh, the account was men, women, and children, even old people. The majority were slain. Only a faithful few receive the seal of God. Notice with me on the screen what this article says here. Polish Adventists meet with President Andrzej Duda, February 5, 2019. It says, despite differences in faith and ethnicity, we create, notice the words, a national community of people on Polish soil, emphasized Andrzej Duda, the president of uh, Poland, uh, doing a meeting with representatives uh, of how many? Of all major churches, religious associations, and ethnic and uh, national minorities. Present in Poland, four, notice carefully, leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Poland were among the invitees who met at the presidential palace on Saturday 19th January 2019. Now, this is the same Poland that last year the president of Poland signed as a result of the trade union, as a result of the push from the Roman Catholic Church, the president signed a Sunday law in Poland where last year you could only have shop opened to Sundays out of the month. This year is is only one Sunday out of the month. By 2020, it will be almost entirely no Sunday shopping in uh, Poland. And again, uh, the Catholic Church, the trade union have pushed for that and the president of Poland signed this. Notice with me what this article says here. From the Catholic National Register, April 2nd, 2018, taking Sunday seriously, Poland leads the way. The Polish government enacted a new law that bans most businesses from being open more than two Sundays a month. In 2018, by 2020, retailers will only be able to open on seven days a, a year. The law initially proposed by the Solidarity Labor Union in 2016, was endorsed by both the ruling law and Justice Party and the nation's Catholic bishops. Once again, this is uh, the nation there that has uh, a Sunday law in place right now and uh, will gradually be implemented and getting worse and worse and worse. It is that same nation or the president there, that the, those four Adventist leaders met there with. Now, first of all, according to Revelation 13, verses 11 through 14, we read about the image of the beast, church and state coming together to create the image of the beast. That is exactly what we are reading about here with the Seventh-day Adventists, the other religions, with the state in Poland. Back to the article from Adventist News Network. Four leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Poland were among the invitees who met at the presidential palace on a which day? Here's the emphasis there. On which day? On Saturday, 
the 19th of January 2019, according to Andrzej Zizensky, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, Director for the Polish Adventist Church. This demonstration's recognition, notice carefully, at the highest state level for religious pluralism within the country. For what again? For religious pluralism. We'll come back to religious pluralism there, what that means. But let's go back to the specific day that they met there with the state, with the government. On which day? Saturday. And what is Saturday? That is the Sabbath. What was the counsel given to us about the, the, this holy day, the seventh day of the week, which reminds us of our Creator, which reminds us of our Redeemer, which reminds us that we were once slave to sin, once in Egypt, but God has delivered us and has set us apart. What was part of the council based on spirit of prophecy and in Isaiah 58. Notice on the screen what it says there. Spirit of prophecy tells us, God has given men six days wherein to labor and he requires that their own work be done in the six working days. Acts of necessity and mercy are permitted on the Sabbath. The sick and suffering are at all times to be cared for, but unnecessary labor is to be strictly avoided. Why? Because Isaiah 58 tells us, Turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure. That's Isaiah 58:13 nor does the prohibition end here, nor speaking thine own words, Isaiah 58 goes on to say, says the prophet, those who discuss business matters or lay plans on the Sabbath are regarded by God as though engaged in the actual transaction of what else? Of business, notice carefully, to keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of all, what are the words? Worldly character. Now to meet on Saturday, on the Sabbath, with the state there, that is worldly business, worldly affairs, that should have never taken place uh, on the Sabbath. But again, because uh, we have been barring to roam, the Sabbath they, is no longer a big deal to them, as they have said before, that it's not a big deal to even worship on Sunday, to have services on, on Sunday. Back to the article from Adventist News Network. Notice, it goes on to say again, the latter part there, this demonstrates recognition at the highest state level for religious pluralism within the country. What does that mean, religious pluralism? So what was the reason why they lay aside the Sabbath of the Lord, trampling upon the Sabbath of the Lord, and uh, we're having business affairs, worldly affairs with the state. What does uh, the expression religious pluralism mean? Notice with me this article here, which we looked at recently from Catholic News Agency, February 4th, 2019. This was the meeting that Pope had with the Imam there in uh, the Muslim world. Pope Francis signed peace declaration on human fraternity with Grand Imam. What's the word there? The pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in His wisdom through which He created human beings, the document states. So the Pope says that pluralism is willed by God. That is not biblical. God has always a faithful few. God is never in the pluralism. In times of ignorance, Acts 17.30 says, God winks at, but now call all men to repentance. If we are ignorant of uh, God's word, that's one thing. But if we know what God's word says, that we must be set apart from the world, and then, but yet rejecting that counsel and uh, get into pluralism and ecumenism and uh, unifying church and state together, those men are not 
Seventh-day Adventists. They are Jesuits once again within Seventh-day Adventists. Speaking of pluralism, let's get some more understanding. What does it mean, religious pluralism? Notice this next article here. Pope Francis and the new pluralism from HuffPost. It says, because all people are created in God's image, all are capable of doing good, the Pope says. The implication is that Christians shouldn't be surprised to find others, whether of different religions or no religion. Notice, doing good and should be eager to, what are the next few words, to partner with them. So according to what pluralism is, it's the same thing, or the definition there, or based on what the Pope says, the same thing as coexist or come together ecumenism or one world religion notice next article here it says here from the daily news january 29th 2019 religious pluralism essential for social what's the word peace says president macron notice now so what another definition for pluralism peace coming together coexist. Here's what uh, Wikipedia tells us about uh, religious pluralism. It says, religious pluralism is an attribute or attitude or policy regarding the diversity of religious belief systems. What's the word? Coexisting in society. It can indicate one or more of the following. Notice, as the name of the worldview, according to which one's own religion is not held, notice carefully, to be the sole and exclusive source of truth. We'll come back to that. And thus, the acknowledgement that at least some truths and true values exist in other religions. So, what is the definition there? According to the Wikipedia on religious pluralism, let's read that one more time. Notice, it says, the middle part there, after the coexisting part, it can indicate one or more of the following as the name of the worldview, according to which, notice, one's own religion is not, emphasis there, is not held to be the sole and exclusive source of truth. Here it is. The reason why we've been meeting, gathering with uh, the apostates and uh, with uh, Babylon, it's because we do not consider us as a peculiar people that we have the source of truth. We believe that the Catholic has some truth, the Muslim has some truth, the Hindus have some, some truth, the Protestants, so-called Protestants, evangelicals, have some truth. So therefore, we all worship the same God. That's what pluralism is about. We can all come together, we can have our diverse beliefs at the same time, but we worship the same God. No wonder, again, those words there should ring a bell. What words? The words back to the screen. It says again, one's own religion is not held to be the sole and exclusive source of truth. Where have we heard the words source of truth before? Notice, back to the screen. This is from uh, fundamental beliefs number 18 that you would find uh, when we had the 27 fundamental beliefs. It was then fundamental belief number 17, the gift of prophecy. It used to say one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White as the Lord's messenger. Her writings are a continuing and authoritative, what are the next three words? Source of truth. This is where we used to find those three words, very important, saying that Sister White was the Lord's messenger and then her writings contain source of of truth, our source of truth. But since 2015, at the GC session, what did they remove? Back to the screen again. The bottom part there in the middle. They removed the Lord's messenger. They removed source of truth. All of those things are have been omitted. Now, 
if they have omitted those things, that means now we are allowed to meet with the governments with the apostate religions because we are now one. Do you get that, brothers and sisters? That's what's happening. Back to the Adventist News Network article. It goes on to say, while the Adventist representatives did not have the opportunity to speak, what? In the public forum, the event did give them a chance to share Adventist values during the more informal discussion surrounding the meeting. So they did not have a chance to speak. They did not have a chance to share anything. What was the reason why they were there? That is an abomination. That is an apostasy, brothers and sisters. The latter part of what we just read there, they were giving an excuse. Oh, at least we were there to share something. What did you share? The great hoax, I'm sure, not the great controversy. If they even brought the great hoax with them, I believe they were drunk with the wine of Babylon. They did not share anything. The fact that they were there in the first place on Saturday, it's the Sabbath, shows that they had been made drunk by the wine of Babylon. That's Again, a unification of church and state meeting on the Lord's Sabbath day, trampling upon the Sabbath of the Lord. Notice with me what Sister White says here on the screen. She says from Great Controversy 592 paragraph 3, the dignitaries of what? Church and state will do what? Unite to bribe, persuade, or compel how many classes? All classes to honor the what? The Sabbath. They will do what? To honor the Sunday, to honor the Sunday, not the Sabbath of the Lord. They will come together, unite, pluralism, religious pluralism, ecumenism, to unite against whom? Against the remnant, against the faithful few, brothers and sisters. Notice another passage here. Sister White goes on to say, the warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. And at that time, the superficial conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies because they are in pluralism, ecumenism, toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. These apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity, doing all in their power to do what? To oppress and malign their former brethren and to do what? To excite indignation against them. This day is what? Is just before us. And as we've been looking at one abomination after another, how they are defending Rome, how, how they have been trampling upon the Sabbath of the Lord, and they're supposed to be seven Adventists, this day of betrayal is upon us. And as I mentioned a moment ago, when I said that if we remain with this uh, organization, not talking about leaving the seven day Adventist church, talking about this organization that has hijacked the Seventh-day Adventist church, the General Conference, those Jesuits there, we are going to be lost. We are going to receive the wrath of God as in Ezekiel, in the case of Ezekiel chapter 9, because these men, like the Jews, have forsaken the Sabbath of the Lord. Go to the book of Hebrews with me, chapter 3. They will not enter the promised land. Why? Notice in Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, let's begin uh, verse 15. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the days of, uh, or as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, how be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? That's the question. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Who are they? Notice. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Uh, unbelief. So what was the reason why they did not enter into God's rest? What was the sin that or one of the greatest sins that they have committed. Verse 
1 of chapter 4, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with, uh, notice now, with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Notice, so what was the sin? The Sabbath. It was the Sabbath of the Lord that they were trampling upon. As a result of them, many fell in the wilderness. But uh, God says He still has a Sabbath day for us to observe. Skip on down with me to verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would He not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There remaineth therefore the Sabbath rest. There remaineth therefore the seventh day rest. Sabbath rest that God has given us, has set aside, and uh, has uh, put at the heart of the Ten Commandments. He says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth uh, and rested uh, on uh, the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day or the Sabbath day and uh, hallowed it. And in Isaiah 58, uh, we were called to repair the bridge that was made. Uh, in uh, God's law. And uh, how were we counseled to repair that breach? By observing the Sabbath, by not doing our own things, uh, or that, thine own pleasure, or speaking thine own words on God's Sabbath day, brothers and sisters. And uh, again, uh, the reference to Ezekiel chapter 9. We find uh, that passage there goes along, or that chapter there goes along with the third angel's message. Those who worship the beast and his image and, his, and receive his mark on their foreheads and on their hands receive the mark of the beast and the wrath of God. But those who are faithful to God, they have the faith of Jesus, then they keep his commandments. Revelation 14, 12. Brothers and sisters, we must be the remnant in these last days. Not the, the organization, not the popular Adventists that we find today. We have to make a bold stand for God for the truth's sake because these leaders are taking us down to the Romans. These leaders are taking us eventually down to hell. Let's pray. Loving Father which art in heaven, give your people the courage, the strength, right now to stand as we are being surrounded on every side our worst enemies are within us. Give your people the eyes of to be able to see before it's too late. And unfortunately, many have chosen to remain in darkness, in, rem in remaining with this organization. Lord, shake your people at this time. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Help us, Lord, to sound the alarm to continue to give the warning for this time so that those who have ears to hear may hear until you come again in the clouds of glory in jesus name amen